I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Kay He. Kay rose to be one of the youngest managing directors at BlackRock's hedge fund of funds business. And then, in his 30s, he left the industry to explore what would come next. His path led to writing a blog and coaching about facing fears and insecurities attached to the relationship of psychology and money. Kay has since been dubbed the Oprah for Millennials by CNN and Wall Street Guru by Bloomberg. Our conversation starts with his career on Wall Street evaluating mortgage derivative hedge fund strategies, reaching his lifelong career goals, and then leaving it behind. Kay discusses his path and asks questions that provoke an exploration of the value of money, including the power of asking why, what to do if you won the lottery, how much to leave behind for your children, the marginal utility of money, and lessons on staying the course on an entrepreneurial path. Kay's real-time journey tackles issues that many in our profession face when they take a moment to reflect on their lives. The lessons reminded me of my conversation with Harvard Business School professor Tom DeLong, which I've replayed on the feed. Today's episode is sponsored by Common Fund Institute's Investment Stewardship Academy. The Academy is a premier educational program for trustees and senior staff that have the honor and responsibility to steward long-term capital for an institution or family office. This year's event will take place at the Yale School of Management from June 24th to June 28th. I'm serving on the Board of Trustees faculty for this year's Academy and will lead a discussion of investment committee best practices. Limited spots remain for this year's program. You can email events at commonfund.org to register. Today's show is also sponsored by Manny Friedman and EJF Capital, who have in mind a fascinating way of getting your attention on an investment opportunity. Manny and EJF are so passionate about the future development of the U.S. through qualified opportunity zones that he asked me to find a way to urge people with taxable gains to take a closer look at these investments. The government came out with the next round of regulatory clarifications on April 17th, and we now have answers to frequently asked questions that may have prevented investors from diving in previously. EJF has a fund that is investing in a bunch of projects across the country, but Manny's sponsorship isn't about his fund specifically. It's more about getting the word out so this innovative government program can be successful. The incentives for taxable investors in both real estate and new operating businesses in opportunity zones are massive, and if the program scales, it has the potential to transform economic development for the better in a way that may be bigger than any of us can envision. So that's it. Manny's trying to spread the word and get smart folks to pay attention and find investments in opportunity zones. EJF's fund is one possibility, and there are plenty of others too. But please take a look if you haven't already. If you want to learn more, have a listen to my podcast with Manny about the opportunity zones. It's episode number 91. Please enjoy my conversation with Kay He. Okay, you're on the other side of the mic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's great to see you. I think for perspective, it'd be great to start with your background from financial services. And we'll, obviously, we'll talk about outside of financial services. All right. So I guess I'll start with I was a nerdy high school kid that was really fixated on the path, the trajectory. And a lot of that came from being the child of first-generation immigrants, where they were just like, find that career that pays you well, and just ride that train until the sunset. And so I followed that playbook. I went to Yale. I was a CS major. I did like computers, but because I thought that that was like the best ROI degree. 2001 graduated. The investment banks descended upon us. It was pre-dot-com meltdown. I didn't even know what investment banking was. I was going to say I Googled. That didn't exist. I had someone explain to me what due diligence meant probably 90 minutes before my first Morgan Stanley interview, which I didn't get the job. Graduated, went to investment banking, 
hated it was tech banking at Broadview, which is now Jeffrey's. What'd you hate about it? The hours. I hated the hours. I hated how much like copy and pasting was involved in the job. I mean, we would spend hours looking for logos and like formatting them for PowerPoint. It was less even the hours, but it was the fact that at any point in your life, your BlackBerry could go off and someone could say, I'm ruining the next 10 hours of your life and be a dick about it. And that's what, like, I don't mind working like 60, 70, 80 hours a week, but just that scepter hanging over you that someone will say, that's it, your weekend's done, was just too much for me to bear. I didn't even stay my two years. And I found a job via the classifieds. I mean, now I'm dating myself, <laughs> but it was Fund of Hedge Funds. It was a small firm called Treesdale Partners that was doing predominantly fixed income arbitrage strategies. And they were like, oh, you like computers? You probably could figure out these arbitrage strategies. And I was like, oh, okay. And we built a fund of funds from kind of the ground up, 67 million when I joined. And when I left in 07, it was uh, like 1.2 billion with six or seven employees. And you know, those are the one in 10 days. Those are the one in 10 days when we were making above 10% net of fees. Parlay that into BlackRock Fund of Funds, which was merged with Quello. So I joined one of the largest fund of funds right around the credit crisis, was running their relative value strategies and ultimately ran the New York research team, like 10 analysts or so, and did that until 2015. I was 35. I guess it was my early midlife crisis, probably started brewing in my early 30s. And I just pulled the ripcord at 35. I quit with no plan, 18 months of, I mean, I had savings, but I had 18 months of cash that I was willing to run to zero. I call it the angel investment in myself and said, I'm just going to figure it out. And four years later, I guess I'm a blogger, podcaster, writer, speaker who lives in Manhattan Beach, California. <laughs> All right. Let's rewind a little bit of that in your time in investing. What were the aspects of it that you remember liking? I loved that you could 10,000 hours your way into a competitive advantage. So like by sheer brute intellectual force and curiosity, you could outlearn the competition. And I think it was particularly salient in the fund of hedge funds industry where we were second derivatives of the investing process. And so, for example, like I really understand mortgage derivatives, which as you recall, like those are some of the more complicated instruments to evaluate and they have so many risks, shape of the yield curve, liquidity premium, things like that. And it was always fun for me to really put the hat on of a mortgage derivatives trader, not a fund of funds analyst who invested in mortgage derivatives and say, okay, if I was going to buy the security, like what are all the things that I would need to understand about it? And especially I'm not a fundamental investor. I don't really, it's not that I don't believe in it, but it's just not something that resonates with me. But being able to understand the thousands of variables that go into pricing and mortgage derivatives was like intellectually interesting to me. And it was an endless rabbit hole to just keep going down and to get better at. And I think that was what was so cool about Fund of Funds for me was that it gave me this canvas to say like, credit derivatives, go. LTCM, 100 times futures, treasury basis strategies, go. And the limit was just basically like, when did I lose the motivation? Or when did I find something intellectually too difficult and how would I surpass that or would I just choose to stop at that point? And my whole career was based on like doing these sprints down into these like vertical challenges, which I think ultimately became my quote unquote competitive advantage relative to my peers because I was able to sit with the trader, the mortgage derivatives trader, and talk to him like I was like sales coverage or I had the specific language to talk to them. What was your learning process to go down into those rabbit holes? It was a lot of brute force, but I basically... And this kind of came in hindsight when I look back at my life. It came at a little bit of a cost, but I basically didn't read fiction for 15 years. 
But I have read so many white papers on the impact between the shape of the yield curve and mortgage derivative pricing. Or how do you model like Gaussian copula formulas when you're doing credit derivative index arm? So it definitely started with the white paper, like go to the source. And then, you know, a lot of these things, like the books were being written as the events were happening, right? Like there is no credit derivatives book in like the late 2000s. So that was a starting point. But then the next was being able to converse with a practitioner. And I think that that was something that I did differently where a lot of fund of funds allocators were, you know, they interface with prime brokerage, they interface with the allocator community. There's like a lot of comparing notes there. I was like, I'm like, who's the biggest mortgage derivatives trader on the street and how do I get to meet him or her? And so I would go to ASF, which is like a big mortgage conference. I'd be like one of the few fun to fun guys there. But I was in the room talking about the yield curve, talking about how liquidity had been changing. And so I'm a great learner through like rote academic theory. And then I kind of test myself with practitioners and I just... I love being around people. So those things then bled into friendships that I still maintain to this day, even though I don't think about Morgan derivatives ever. <laughs> so talk a little bit through your career. You're at BlackRock. You're obviously deep in this particular space. How were you thinking about it at the time and how did it progress? I'll take you back briefly before BlackRock. In 2003, when I joined the fund of funds industry, I knew nothing. And I kind of looked around, and I, it's not that I was smart or had some unique insight, but I said to myself, this industry is not going to be around for more than 10 years. I'm like, and it was mostly because we were expensive middlemen. It wasn't even a theory, but I was just like, I don't think expensive middlemen is like a great game you want to be in for the long term. So that's all I knew. And I also realized that I met a lot of dopes in the industry. So there was like dopey, expensive middlemen. So I was like, something feels off. And so I kind of had this 10-year clock where I was like, this game's not going to go on forever. And so what will I do once it runs out? Like that was in my back of my mind from the day I started in the industry. So fast forward to BlackRock and I'm starting to run a team. And being at BlackRock and Quellos and the 2008 crisis was the best thing that happened to me because I was young enough, like I was in my early 30s. So I hadn't like built up enough of a cachet or enough savings to lose a lot. And I was young enough that I was still like the cheap go-getter, no kids workhorse. And when 2008 happened, I was covering relative value managers. So I had a front row seat to like some of these big, big prime, bro, you know, is there renegotiations, all that crap. But um, I also got like a ton of battlefield promotes where they were kind of like senior staff was getting pushed out. And I was just like, hey, I'll do it. I'll do it. I, I don't need to go home. And that time period really kind of changed my trajectory. And to give credit to the management at Quellos, like they were very good about giving younger folks opportunity. I mean, I was really young and they were giving me and others, many of whom kind of run the business now, a tremendous amount of opportunity. So that was kind of like the nexus of 2008 that was really impactful on my career. And as you evolved through from there until say you left 2015, what were you thinking about in terms of your life and career at that time? So I got promoted to MD at 32. And when you date back to that like insecure 16-year-old K, like that was what he was playing for. He didn't know the terminology at that point, but that was what he was playing for. And I was like, yo, I did this. And again, it like at that point, we're not even one in 10 money. We're like 40 basis point money. I wasn't independently wealthy and you know I needed to work, but I had a, a great taste of financial success and status recognition, two things that I had been dreaming of since I was like a young kid. And then I got them. And then I thought that like all of a sudden rainbows would form in the sky and the oceans would part as I walked through Times Square and everyone would be my friend. And, and it was just like, wait a minute, nothing about my life has changed. Brene Brown uses this phrase, low-grade anxiety. I had this like burgeoning low-grade anxiety that was kind of like, 
I looked around and I saw people who were like 15, 20 years older than me. And I could see those 20 years, boom. I could see them go by. My kids would go to the best private schools. I'd have a couple X5s and, you know, house and summit. And I'd still be wearing those same Brooks Brothers shirts and that same stain would still be on the carpet. But I was just like, I don't want that. And it was nagging at me. And I feel fortunate to have had a taste of success at a relatively young age, which kind of made that, it kind of brought more urgency to it. Because I was like, yo, I'm 32, 33 years old. Let's make something happen. And so there was, the, there was that seed planted that was like, is this it? This is right around when like Facebook and the iPhone and like, cool shit happening everywhere. And I try to bring this into the meetings. I'm like, guys, like, not like I was some crazy Bitcoin person, but like, can we talk about Bitcoin? And they're like, no, this is completely irrelevant. I'm like, can we just entertain the possibility that there might be something here? They're like, no, like weirdo tech guy, like keep that hobby by yourself. So I was like, I just bought some. (laughs) And so I was just kind of like, a lot of finance people talk about how curious and open-minded they are, but when ideas don't fit in their very narrow mental model purview, they're very quick to dismiss it. And I was just like, you know what? This is not for me. And the last thing was really, I didn't realize it at the time. I see it in hindsight. Finance had what I felt was like so much of a zero-sum game mentality, where it's like, if I win, someone has to lose. If I get promoted this person gets left behind, you know, bonus pool, like points and things like that. And it just brought out a lot of unattractive qualities in people. And I was like, I don't think the world works that way. I think that there are many situations where one plus one equals three. And even if there's not, to just assume that someone's always taking what could be yours is just like not a mind space that I want to like plant a flag in and and have a career in. And again, I don't think I could verbalize that at the time, but I know in hindsight, I was like, I need to get out of that mindset. So there's this like nagging underbelly Mm -hmm. of call it lack of fulfillment, Mm -hmm. maybe discontent, low grade anxiety. I hear it a lot, right? There's a lot of people in the industry that especially when things are tougher in the last decade or so that express it. What do you do to foster that feeling into some form of action? So again, it's not dissimilar from reading the white papers about mortgage derivatives. It was like, I'm going to throw what I know best, which is like my own time resources at the problem. And so it involved just like trying to build businesses while I was working on Wall Street. And so I would wake up at like four in the morning and I just mothballed so many ideas. For a long time, I wanted to do a CRM, like an online CRM tool that could help people like foster better connections. And so I like wireframe that. And so in the process, I'm like starting to learn a little bit about how like tech products are made. And I'm just tapping into that real like curiosity. For a long time, I've always enjoyed bringing people together. I I thought about building like events companies. So I would organize secret events where I would bring people together. And this was like five to 10. 10 hours a week on top of a 60 to 70 hour a week job trying to push these ideas really started to get into the fintech scene as an advisor angel ish being like oh i could see myself doing something in fintech so basically for two to three years i spent five to ten hours a week on top of my day job trying different things out and then there were two key realizations the first was you cannot tip these ideas over into something bigger with only 10 hours a week. That was the first realization. But the bigger realization was that 90% of my non-family happiness was coming from those 10 hours. And that was the clue. That was the clue that's like, you might not be able to monetize this, but if 10 hours of this work brings you 90% of your joy, just imagine if you spent 50 hours on this or 70 or 100 and that got me closer to the tipping point. And still, we're rolling forward. There is a day where you say, okay, that's it. What happened leading into that? And how'd you make the decision? I had like a vague sense of how much savings I wanted to have. But it's that trap where, you know, like when's the best time to leave Wall Street after next year's bonus? Probably did that for a few years. But the biggest thing that hit me was having a kid. 
And so you would think that having a kid reins you in. That's like, you can't go make zero dollars when you've got this. But having a kid for me made me realize a few things. The first was that she turned one. When she was one, I quit. And the thing that I realized was you could have all the money in the world, but you're only going to have a one-year-old once. And there's a lot of possibility around that, right? Because even if you have $10 billion when you have a 13-year-old kid, unless you're homeschooling them, they go to school and like they have friends. And I think that hit me like, whoa, I don't like to come at these things from like a perspective of scarcity, like this fleeting moment. If you don't capture it, your life's fucked. But I did come at it like, yo, this is a unique window we've been presented with. Why don't we think about seizing it? So that was the powerful realization. And that was the second realization that prompted us to move to LA. We had a three-year-old and a newborn. And it was like, oh, you only have a three-year-old and a newborn once in your life. And you could kind of see the path to, to like school starting to build up. So that was the one thing. And then the second thing was like, what kind of father do I want my daughter to see? Do I want her to see someone that goes in and clips high carry just because it's high carry? Or do I want her to see that at least he tried? That was the thing. Like I had no idea where it was going to go. But I wanted to know myself that I had tried. And for my daughter, I wanted her to know that I tried and see what happens. And so that that was the, like right around when my daughter turned one, I was just like, okay, now it's time to go. And the reality was that those 10 hours were becoming like 11 hours and 12 hours. They were starting to jeopardize my work output. And I was just like, that wouldn't be fair to my employer to do this. And the ball had gained too much momentum. Like there was no pulling back. So you make the leap, you leave BlackRock. What happens? Oh man, I sleep a lot. Uh, I grow out a beard. I get another tattoo. I guess the short answer is that we hop on a plane and we do a family version of Eat, Pray, Love. And so we basically traveled for four-ish months around Asia with uh, our one-year-old. The true like one-way tickets, like you don't know where you're going next around Asia and getting, you know, $14 massages and drinking in the middle of the day. So we did that for a while and then for four-ish months, come back. And then this like dark scepter of self-doubt the clouds emerge, you know, and really what that period was, part of it was a rest and like just disconnecting. There was a form of escapism in that, like, I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought I was going to be a fintech entrepreneur because I was in quant world. I kind of understood the systems that people use and all that, but it was a very linear way. You know, it was like, like tech, like finance, A plus B equals fintech. You know, it's just a very myopic way of looking at things. But again, I'd never been an entrepreneur. Nothing can prepare you for being an entrepreneur. So come back and the deluge of daily text messages. What are you doing these days? And at that time, I was not emotionally prepared to answer that question. My identity was tied into being this like young MD, high work ethic guy, on the trajectory guy. Two stories that I found out later that there were group threads that were basically commenting on like, should we stage an intervention? And then there was another person in the industry who was like, I've seen this playbook before. He's going to spend five times more than he thought he would. He's not going to know how to become an entrepreneur and his wife's going to leave him. So thankfully, I didn't hear that, that specific one at the time. But, you know, you're processing identity and also you're processing like eating into your savings. And I had prepared it. You know, I took I took 18 months worth of living expenses, moved them out of the one account to another account and paid myself a monthly salary with like very comfortable buffers. And so I was like, I've put boundaries around the downside on this, but man, It doesn't matter where you start. When it just goes down, nothing can prepare you for that. And I was not 
ready for that. I started acting like really, my wife would watch me tense up at dinner where normally I'm like quite eager on the cocktails. And she'd be like, how come you're only having one drink? And it was probably because it was like a $17 cocktail and weird things like that started to creep in. So that was the dark period. And I flirted with actually coming back to the industry, starting things that people expected me to start, like doing a seed fund. Again, it was like A plus B equals C. Like you're a C guy, okay? Like just stay in your lane. And thankfully, I didn't. So I flirted with fintech. I flirted with VC. I flirted with family office stuff. But every time I went a few paths down that road, I was like, yo, I did not make these wholesale life changes for this. This is lipstick on a pig. And I ain't into the pig anymore. And so I had 10 to 12 months of savings in my angel account. And I was like, I don't know what I want to do, but I'm just going to do things that make me happy for the next 12 months. And this is like a pearl of an insight that I would love for more people to see. It's like the thing that made me happy wasn't smoking weed and watching Netflix. The thing that was making me happy was like teaching myself web design, writing, organizing more events, learning about other industries. And so they were like discrete micro skills. And so I got a WeWork. I was like negative cash flow. I got a WeWork and I'm like, I'm going to go into my WeWork and I'm going to work on these things. And thankfully I had one little thing to work on, which was my email newsletter, which was truly just like a hobby. It was just like five e links in Gmail with a little bit of commentary, but people liked it. So I was like, well, let's make it better. And what was the original theme of- The original up? theme was, these are five interesting articles that I read about across any topic. And really, I mean, for the longtime followers, it's been 225 weeks of weekly emails. For the longtime followers, like the people that have been there since day one, really what it is, is you just see my evolution as a man, as a father, as an entrepreneur, as a business person. It just went, you know, so like in the early days, it was a lot of fintech, things like that. Then it was around like seed investing and AI and things like that. And then kind of morphed into like self helpy productivity. And now it's kind of gravitating a little bit more to like the psychology and mindsets around money. It kind of like went where I went. And so I just said, I'm going to make this thing better. And that meant setting up MailChimp. That meant designing a logo. That meant understanding how to become a better writer. That meant supporting it with videos. That meant social media, SEO. And they were like little projects that were just very time consuming, deeply rewarding. And I was lucky that I was getting a feedback loop as I was doing it. People were like, this is cool. This is, it's getting better. Like, keep doing this. The other thing, this was very accidental, was that my writing style was, I just kind of threw up my hands and I said, on paper, I should be the happiest guy on the planet. Look at the resume shows that I've done everything, quote unquote, right, but I'm not happy. And I don't know why. I'm not showing up as a father and husband that I want to be. I'm really jealous of people who have more money than me. I'm distracted a lot. I'm afraid, you know, and mortality, like coping with mortality is a big theme. You know, a lot of it came down to that. But I kind of threw up my hands. I was like, guys, this is me. And I think that that was the best accidental decision I could have made. Because in doing that, all these people were like, yo, that's me too. And right away, a rapport was established. And then we've all been on this journey together. And it's like, you know, I'm humbled that like people care enough about my insecurities and the challenges in my life to like want to watch me process it in public, let alone turn it into like a business that really started to kickstart six to eight months after I had quit. And let's fast forward to today. What's the lump sum of this thing, this business that you've created and are creating? Like, what are the activities you're doing today? The activities are a couple hours a day of writing, my newsletter, my blog, Quartz. I'm a contributing editor at Quartz. Then I have a money coaching practice where I have six to eight clients, mostly hedge fund executives and successful entrepreneurs who basically come to me with this question. I have a lot of money and I'm not happy. Why not? What's wrong? And 
we can go into what exactly that means, but that's consultative one-on-one coaching practice. I probably get one to two speaking gigs, and that's what I call the stand-up comedian portion of my life. I was just thinking, I did a talk yesterday. The video didn't come out well. I'm going to go home, and my wife's going to film it in my living room, and I'm going to make it part of my reel. So like, I don't want to get into the circuit. It's a nice source of idiosyncratic income that I enjoy. And with the leftover time, I'm trying, and it's very difficult, I'm trying to figure out how to make other digital sources of revenue, which, full disclosure, I haven't cracked the code. All right, let's tack into this coaching. This is sort of an interesting question, right? Someone who's been successful financially coming to you and saying, I'm not happy. What do you take them through? I'd never give advice. So I really ask, it's basically like the Simon Sinek start with why. You keep asking why until the other person's blue in the face. And so someone will say, Successful manager might say, I'm doing really well, but I can't leave this seat. Why can't you leave this seat? It's like, well, if I left this seat, I couldn't cover my living expenses. What is it about your living expenses that is so inflexible? And like, well, it's, you know, it's really important that my kids get this great education. It's like, well, why is your children's education so important? Are there alternatives that are cheaper? And and then you just kind of like keep going down that path and then like, What usually happens is, but we're all going to die. What's the point? You know, so usually by the fifth why, it's kind of like my self-worth is tied to my money. Or my father told me that I was so bad at money and this is like me proving him wrong. Or I know what it's like to have grown up in poverty and I never want to go back to that place. Like you end up in these places where honestly, oftentimes I tap out where I'm like, this is domain of a therapist. I'm not a therapist. So let me honor that space. But one of the most interesting things about the practice is like, people don't ask the question, why? And so I ask people, why do you make money? And I get some of the most bizarre answers. Someone's like, I do it for optionality. Okay. But options need to be exercised. It's a a trite response that has no meat to it. And so you push like optionality for what? And then you realize that like, you haven't really thought about it, right? Another person said like, we have money so we could realize our dreams. It's like, well, what are your dreams? What are your kids' dreams? I don't know. And these are like super basic. I mean, you could do them yourself, but there's something about having someone ask you them. So there's a lot of like the why and the why will come back to identity and so on. This is a fun question that I ask. I ask people, If you won the lottery, how would you spend the next five years of your life? It's a trick question because you're not going to want to do one thing for five years. You're going to want to do like 10 things. And eight of those 10 things will actually resemble work. They'll just be on your terms. And so then you start to get into this, this space of like, I want money But what I really want is autonomy. And so I'm using money to buy back autonomy. But is there a way to get autonomy without getting money, right? Like there's a lot of ways to get autonomy without earning money. That's the long route to autonomy. And so you kind of start to poke at these things. And for some people, it's honestly like basic, basic tweaks. Someone said to me like, well, one of my dreams is to take a cooking class. I have to wait till I retire. I have to wait 16 years to take it. Take the fucking class. And he's like, yeah, he had this realization. He's like, yeah, I'm willing to put my retirement on hold for four weeks to take a cooking class. I'm like, okay, if that's the way you need to rush, like, good, that's a good step in the right direction. But that question, how would you spend your time? Most people don't happen and don't know the answer to that. And I love this tweet by Jason Zweig from the journal. It's like, most people don't know what makes them happy, don't know what will make them happy and misunderstood what has made them happy in the past. And so really my coaching is to help people answer that question. The writing piece, you talked about things in and around the psychology of money. What are some of the recent things you've written that speak to that? One that really captures the, I like to provoke and then leave people with a possibility. Provocative possibility, I guess, would be the genre that I would call myself. So so the question that I ask is, how much do you want your kids to inherit? And People just in general don't like meditations on mortality. So right away, there's like a, why? 
why are you asking me that? But it confounds a lot of things, this question. So for starters, you think of it like a DCF, right? The terminal value is a big driver of the valuation. So it's actually an important variable in the financial picture. And what I have found is when I've asked my coaching clients, they came from middle-class backgrounds, a lot of children of first-generation immigrants. The amount of money and success they've had is 100x beyond what they ever thought they would have and what their parents ever thought they would have for them. So that's like the starting point of a lot of the people. There's just this, holy shit, like this is happening to me? And, and it's like, great, but it's also like when humans discovered fire, like we, we moved so far up the food chain that we were like, wait a minute, we're like now the kings of the jungle? Like we're not really like evolutionary ready for this. So a lot of these humble, like hardworking people in finance will say, well, I work so hard because I want my kids to have the best opportunity. And so then the next question I ask, well, how much do you want your kids to inherit? Let's just be easy. Let's use today's dollars. Forget inflation. And they'll say like something along the lines of like, I want to pay for their college. I want to give them like a couple of years to like live in New York and not have to work in finance, do a nonprofit or something like that. And maybe, maybe like help them on their down payment. Okay, what's that? 800K in today's terms? Less? You have two kids. You want to leave your kids $1.6 million in today's dollars. But you're like working to become the CIO of a hedge fund or the partner of the law firm, working your fucking face off because in your head, you think that like you can make $20 million or $10 million. But there's this dissonance there. That delta of like what you think you can make to provide opportunity for your kids, let's say it's $20 million, and the 1.6 you actually want to leave them, that's like $18.4 million of a lot of fucking work. And I think that like, it's a weird way to think about these things, but it's kind of like, I reassure myself because I'm in that 1.6K bucket. When I'm like stressing about money, it's like, hey, remember, when you're gone, like that's all you want to leave. All the other stuff you're doing, it's other things. Don't call it in the name of your kids. It's your ambition. It's your ego. It's your identity. Not bad things. That's when your mind starts playing these tricks on you. You have to raise your hand and you say, this is actually not in the best interest of my children. I'm doing this because it's my way of self-actualizing or so on. And so getting people to pull at those threads and see the differences, there's a lot of freedom in that. And people don't like to think about that stuff. You need to be provocative to like go in there and call people out. What are the other common memes that you've seen through your writing and talking to people about this? The biggest one is this kind of marginal utility of money question. What's the next dollar worth to you? And there's like the Kahneman research, you know, 75K. It's like, you probably know this. It's actually wrong. And do you know why it's wrong? Because that's all survey data. Rich people don't fill out surveys. And they definitely don't fill out surveys about how rich they are. So it's actually not really accurate. But I think we can all conceptually agree that money has some kind of margin. It flatlines at some point, right? I mean, if Bezos doubles for every person, it's personal. For every family, it's personal. So I sketch out this marginal utility curve for people. And there's three points on it to keep it simple. There's a point like in the steep part of the curve, which is like when you're in poverty or leaving poverty, where there's a real benefit. You know, if you make 15K, doubling your earnings makes a material difference on your life. Then there's the flatlining part where you're Jeff Bezos, where if you double to 20 billion, it's worthless to you. It means nothing. And then there's like that inflection point where probably most of us lie somewhere there. So I ask people, what does it take you to get from point B to the Jeff Bezos point? How much money and what will you do with that money? And there's two answers that come up. The first answer, and again, a lot of these people are nouveau riche in the sense that they didn't come from money. They're like, I want to get to the Bezos point because it keeps me as far away as possible from point A, which is kind of the scarcity mindset, this kind of belief that like everything with a snap of a finger, everything could be taken away from you. The other reason people want to get to the Bezos point is because they want autonomy or more time. 
So again, there's that circularity. You want to earn money to get more time back. And again, this is where I push people. It's like, sure, you could do that, or you could make less money and keep some of your time. And again, like our society is not really conditioned to that, right? Like if the person like passes on the promotion, they're perceived as a failure, but that actually might be the right decision for like 80% of the population who actually wants to trade money for time. What are the key lessons you've taken out of making this dramatic career shift? Markets can stay irrational longer than investors can stay solvent. There is a version of this that applies to entrepreneurship which is basically like people can think you're crazy longer than you can stay emotionally solvent. And that's where these questions of money, why did I care that people were asking me, what are you doing? But you talk to any new entrepreneur, that question is like hell. And so what I kind of stumbled upon, like this was not by design, was I found ways to boost my emotional solvency Unless you can stay emotionally solvent, you're done. But again, I mean, it's the same way that like the Seth Klarmans and the Buffets is like, if you can then shift that from being a disadvantage to an advantage, in their case, like true permanent long-term capital, yo, it is green open fields. And you got to get out of that trough. And I mean, that's the thing is like a lot of people don't make it out of that trough. And I think it's because of the emotional, their emotional solvency breaks. And it could be because of money. It's usually because of status. And they're like, this is too painful. I'm out. That would be the first lesson. The second lesson is related to like my first generation immigrant kind of upbringing is it is possible for things to be meaningful if they're fun. Or maybe said differently, you don't have to suffer to have good things in life. We believe that what that's saying is not doing hard work gets rewarded. That's not what it means. What it means is that you can be invested in something and find joy in it, and the end product can bring you joy. And that rewiring has really kind of guided me where my compass for like how I spend my time is like, is this thing fun? That could sound irrational as an entrepreneur. But to me, it's the competitive advantage that I have. If I find the thing fun and my competitor doesn't find it fun, I'm going to bet on the guy that's having fun all day. And so that's been the second big revelation. And I think the third is that there is a leap of faith in all this. You have to jump and I'm a very, like, I model things. And at some point, you just got to throw the model out and go with your intuition and again, it ties with like point number one is that emotional solvency is that as you start to kind of get those reps in, the whole world opens up, but there's so much trusting. I'll give you a perfect example. I spend more money now than I did when I was on Wall Street. I'm negative income still. And it's a combination of all of the things I just told you. I just have a trust in what I'm doing. And I know that like, it'll be bumpy to get to break even, but I could see it. And I know that it's going to be really hard to knock me off that at this point in the journey. A lot of my coaching comes from my own experience. I've moved in that marginal utility curve. I'm very confident I'm not going back to point A. I have a lot of trust in my backup plans. It might not be the greatest job, but I think I can get a job that can cover our living expenses. And I probably might even enjoy it. Are there aspects of what you did that you're sort of missing? And you know, I'll give you one example. You were looking at mortgage derivatives, like a highly quantitative exercise. And now you're doing a lot of like psychology and introspection. So it's left side of the brain, right side of the brain. How do you bring back the skills that you enjoyed practicing for a while in something that's just sort of quite different? I do miss it. But the things that I miss about my old life are not the things that you would think. I really miss the social interaction. This kind of like solo creator path is like extremely lonely and you have no sounding boards. Yeah, you have friends and all that, but like you really don't have any sounding boards. You sit with a laptop by yourself, right? And I'm a social person. I like hearing stories, you know? So I think that's one thing that I miss. I also miss... There's so many smart people in the financial services industry, 
And you just take for granted that you could just show up in an industry and just be surrounded by people that, and it's not just smart, finance smart, just like worldish smart. And I don't know many other industries, so I can't compare, but I miss that a lot. But the thing that I still do that I kind of, again, I realized it after is one of the things that I loved, loved about being in finance was teaching. So I was the guy that did all the one-on-ones with my direct reports. I wrote the training manuals. I did the lunch and learns on credit derivatives. And I'm doing a version of that right now. My writing is a form of teaching. My coaching is a form of teaching. It just believes so passionately that the transfer of knowledge of something that I know that you may not know, that I can kind of present to you in a way that's accessible and that could change your life, that's still there every day. And so I definitely am able to do that. I'd say the last thing is that surprisingly in the world of being a solo creator, there's actually a lot of very analytical things that are required. And so if there wasn't that kind of feedback loop of conversion rates and SEO, like that's just enough of a taste to keep my quantitative brain humming just enough. I don't want to do that full time, but I miss that, but I have a little bit of that. What's the one thing that you'd like to be doing now that you either haven't had time to or don't have the resources to? Any answer that I will give you is is a function of the responsibilities of having kids. So the first thing that comes to mind is like, we live on the coast and There's plus two hours north, two hours south that I could drive to to chase waves when they're firing. And I don't have like a nine to five job, so I could go whenever. But I can't do that because of my fatherhood duties. And so that's probably the thing that I miss. I miss the untetheredness of not having kids and the freedom that that could afford you. But it doesn't like bum me out because I know that the minute that I'm able to do that is the minute that they stop needing 100% of my time. And I don't know which scares me more of like, am I more excited to be able to just grab my surfboard and drive for two hours and no one gives a shit of where I am? Or am I terrified of the fact that I could go surf for two hours and my kids are like, don't even know that I'm gone. But... I really have tried to design a life. Like that's how would you live your life if you won the lottery? The things are actually, I would spend a lot of time with my kids. I would write, I would teach others and I would do cool digital products and I would surf and I would like meditate and sleep. I kind of do that every day. I try to say that with humility, but what I would say is that that's much more accessible to you, especially to the listeners of your podcast, than you think. This is a very, very privileged group of people with a lot of financial resources at their disposal and with a high degree of education and relationship. If there's a group that can craft life on their own terms, it's your group of listeners, my readers. And again, this is not a promo for quitting your job because that's probably not the right thing for most people to do. But it is a reminder of the possibilities that are out there if you're just willing to kind of tweak the parameters and ask yourself the question, like, why am I doing this? All right, Kay, let's turn to a couple of closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? Ah, I just answered that. Surfing. Surfing is a great metaphor for life because... When people think about surfing, they think about like Kelly Slater shredding. But 95% of surfing is just like sitting around on a board, waiting, sometimes with FOMO, sometimes with irritation that there's no swell. And I think that it really forces you to, like I have almost as much fun as on like the Kelly Slater days than on the days when it's flat as a lake. You're with your own thoughts. You don't have your phone. Oh, it's so nice to not have your phone. You're in nature. There's dolphins nearby. So yes. What's your biggest pet peeve? People who say, I don't have time. It's not true. If you ask someone like, well, why don't you exercise more? And they say, I don't have time. What they really mean is I have chosen to not prioritize exercise in my life. And I think the language that we use in our own heads shapes our realities. So everyone has the time. 
And I think that just that reframing can help you confront why you actually don't have the time to exercise or see your kids. What reading do you almost never miss? I'll give you three. Eugene Way. And he only writes probably like once a quarter, but it takes a quarter to read what he writes. There's another, it's kind of an oddball, Ashley Willens. She's a Harvard researcher. She's the main researcher, to my knowledge, about the relationship between time and money. And I think that is at the crux of a lot of these existential questions. And then the third would probably be Atul Gawande. Like I just have a man crush on his polymathishness. He's such a good writer. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? That love is limitless, like the love that you have for your kids. And it's a simple thing, but I remember that every time my dad would peel us oranges, and he would peel us oranges, and he would like take the little white parts around the edge of, the, of and he'd like make these like perfectly peeled oranges and would give them to us as kids to eat. And I would watch him eat it, his own orange, and he wouldn't do that. And I found myself just accidentally doing that for my own kids. And I was just like, I mean, I have goosebumps just thinking about it. I will always peel every little string off an orange for my children until my last day. And they taught me that. All right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? You do not have to beat yourself up to be a high performer. So negative self-talk has negative expected utility in your life. Great. Okay, super interesting. Great to see you, man. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 